Uh, Direct with Trey here. I'm here with my friend Benson Varghese with Varghese Somerset. Talk to you a little bit about DWIs and what you should and shouldn't do. Hi, I'm Benson Varghese. I'm the managing partner of Varghese Somerset. We're a Fort Worth criminal defense firm. We handle all kinds of cases from DWIs all the way up to capital murders. I'm here today to talk to you about DWIs and some of the things that you should watch out for if an officer suspects you are intoxicated while you're driving a car. The first of the three standardized field sobriety tests is the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. This is where an officer takes a stimulus, either a pen or a pen light, and he will hold it 12 to 15 inches away from the subject's face. He'll do a couple of things to screen the individual before he starts this test. He will ask if they've had any recent head injuries. He will ask if they're wearing contacts, and he will do a pass where he's making sure both eyes track the stimulus equally. In other words, one eye is not going in one direction and the other eye either staying still or going in a different direction. That's called equal tracking. That's not part of the test, it's just a screening process in the test. The test itself has three parts. The officer is gonna check first for lack of smooth pursuit. That's where he takes the stimulus and he's gonna move it out, checking to his right and to the subject's left eye first, taking the stimulus in a fashion where it takes about two seconds to go to their shoulder width and two seconds to come back. He's gonna do the same thing for the other eye and then he's gonna repeat that test. What the officer is looking for is lack of smooth pursuit. If you think about a windshield wiper and how it moves across a wet windshield, there's no stuttering, it doesn't stop, that's what a person who is not intoxicated is able to do. The eyes follow in a smooth fashion. When you're drinking, the first thing to be affected is your ability to think and make decisions, and the next is your muscles. And the muscles that control your eyes are among the smallest in your body and the first to be affected. So what he's looking for is a lack of smooth pursuit where your eye is actually jerking as it follows the stimulus. So a windshield wiper going across a dry windshield is a good example. He's gonna look for that jerking and if he sees it, he's gonna put that down as a clue of intoxication. The next portion of the test is where he tests for what's called distinct and sustained nystagmus at maximum deviation. That's a fancy way of saying he's gonna take the stimulus out to shoulder length, he's gonna hold it there. And as the person is focused on that stimulus, he's looking to see if the eye is jerking back and forth or if it's just staying there. If it's jerking, if there's that distinct and sustained nystagmus at maximum deviation, which is a 45 degree angle or about shoulder width, then he's gonna put that down as a clue of intoxication. Again, here, the officer is checking both eyes twice. The final test in the horizontal gaze nystagmus is checking for onset of nystagmus prior to 45 degrees. The officer takes his stimulus, he moves it out, and what he's looking for is the jerking of the eye before he gets to shoulder width. And if he sees that, he's gonna need to hold the stimulus there long enough to confirm that it is nystagmus, so he'll probably hold it there for about two seconds. And these timings are very important. They're also often areas that officers make mistakes. So the horizontal gaze nystagmus is a test that we're gonna look at very closely if a person takes it, but we always recommend that a person politely declines to do those tests, particularly because in most situations, we're not gonna have any video evidence of what the individual's eyes were doing. We're only gonna see the back of the officer's head, the stimulus moving, and not the person's eyes. And we won't be able to see, we'll have to take the officer at his word for whether or not there was that involuntary jerking of the eyes. The second field sobriety test is the walk and turn test. The walk and turn test begins with the instruction phase. The officer asks the individual to get into the starting position. That is left foot on an imaginary straight line, right foot in front of that left foot, heel touching toe. 
The officer will ask the person to keep their hands down by their side. The officer will go on to give instructions that say, take a series of nine steps touching heel to toe. When you get to the ninth step, keep your lead foot planted and turn using a series of small steps while your lead foot remains planted. Return taking nine heel to toe steps. Keep your arms down to your sides while you're walking and count aloud for each step. The officer will demonstrate three steps. One, two, three. Turn with a series of small steps. Return in three more steps. The officer will say, I have shown you three steps. I would like for you to take nine. Do you understand my instructions? You may go ahead and begin the test. Notice that the officer does not tell the person what the clues are that he's looking for. He won't tell you that he's looking for you to maintain that starting position. So in other words, if you break the starting position of left foot on the line, right foot in front of the left foot, that's considered a clue of intoxication. If you stop while walking, if you use your arms for balance, if you turn improperly, there are eight total clues. If the officer sees even two of those clues, he will consider that person to be intoxicated. So two out of eight clues on the walk and turn is a sign of intoxication for the officer. If you notice our subject, even during the instruction phase, she stands as normal people would stand. She didn't maintain the starting position. She stood with two feet uh, side by side as I continued with my instructions. An officer would count that as a clue of intoxication. When she failed to touch heel to toe exactly, that would be considered a sign of intoxication. Stepping off the line, that's considered a clue of intoxication. So although our subject had absolutely nothing to drink, she's failed that test. Again, we recommend that you don't do field sobriety tests and that you politely decline them. The third and the last of the standardized field sobriety tests is the one leg stand test. For the one leg stand, the officer will ask the individual to get into the starting position that is arms down by your side and feet together. The officer will then say, I would like for you to pick one leg, lift it six inches off the ground, keep your foot level, your arms down to your side and count aloud. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And you'll continue until I ask you to stop. The officer will then demonstrate the test. The officer will typically demonstrate the test for three or four seconds, ask the subject if they understand the directions, and then ask the person to begin the test. Individuals are not told what the clues of intoxication are. If a person puts their foot down, uses their arms for balance, sways, or hops, those are all considered signs of intoxication. And if you have two clues on that test, then you are considered to be intoxicated. Again, our subject was uh, using her arms for balance and she put her foot down. If you put your foot down three times, then that's considered an automatic failure, even if you don't show any other clues of intoxication. So she would have sober failed the one leg stand test as well. Again, politely refused to do the standardized field sobriety test.